that we're gonna see uh, the last day, but it's not the last that we're gonna see you here in Toronto. Um, for uh, Abuna is gonna give us a, t uh, a short um, uh, talk on um, uh, balance on knowledge and spirituality, but also we have uh, questions that you can submit uh, through uh, slido.com, S-L-I-D-O dot com. Right? Uh, if you put it, it will work. S-L-I-D-O dot com, it will work. And then uh, the, the code is balance. The code is balance. So if you put balance, it will uh, open uh, to today's, this session. Okay? So um, if you have any questions, uh, during a bonus talk, uh, what uh, what he's uh, gonna give us now, or something else you would like to ask, uh, put it, and you can also vote up questions, so uh, it will make it up to the top. So I'll talk for a while because there are there are things I want to say, uh, and then I hope we'll have time for, for questions, and we'll see what your own thoughts and reflections are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I was born into a devout evangelical family, and I grew up throughout my childhood and my teenage years completely involved in our evangelical congregation. When I was a young man, I spent three years training in an evangelical seminary, and I expected to spend my life in ministry as a pastor and a missionary. We were very clear that there was a difference between what we called head knowledge and heart knowledge. Heart knowledge meant a personal and experiential relationship with God in Jesus Christ, while head knowledge represented facts and propositions and even theology. The intention was sound. There is no real knowledge of God unless it is experienced. But by dismissing what we called head knowledge, we were left only accepting what felt good to us. Of course, just as there is a danger of a spirituality which becomes only sentimentality, so there is also a spirituality which has no life and is just made up of saying and doing the right things, religious things, without actually becoming a spiritual person. We can turn to the scriptures to discover what is said about knowledge without this experience of God. In James chapter 2 verse 19 we read, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe this and tremble. That God exists is a fact. It is one which Satan and the demons are well aware of. But their knowledge is not an experience of relationship with God. It is knowledge about God rather than now knowledge of God. And our own faith is no different. It has to be more than just knowing facts about God and about Christianity. Otherwise, it is no different than the knowledge of demons. Elsewhere in the New Testament, and I'm not going to go through all of the, the locations, but if you were to study yourself, you'd find there's quite a few more. We can see the same facts about God, knowledge about God, being expressed by demons and Satan himself. In Matthew 8:29, for instance, we hear the demons cry out saying, "What have you got to do with us, O son of God?" And in Mark chapter 1:24, we hear a demon say to the Lord Jesus, "Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the holy one of God." So we should not doubt that Satan himself has a great deal of knowledge about God. He saw the creation of the world. He was present and indeed caused the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He saw all of the miracles that our Lord Jesus performed and even the raising of Lazarus from death. We can even say that he saw the cross and the empty tomb. And it was with his own first-hand experience that he saw the ruin of Hades when the Lord Jesus brought out all those who were in that place, as we sing in our hymns. Satan has a great deal of knowledge about God, more than all of us. But because he has no relationship of life and love with God, 
All of his knowledge cannot bring about salvation and healing because it is not true knowledge of God himself. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, St. Paul says, If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And it seems to me that this expresses the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. It is not that the facts about God don't matter. Of course it matters that we believe that God exists, for instance. But it is how we believe that makes the most important difference. We can believe a great many things in our head as a fact or a proposition, and it can make no difference to our lives whatsoever. Some of the things we believe in this way are rather inconsequential to our ordinary life. I know the names of the planets, for instance, but it doesn't affect or have an impact on my daily life in a meaningful way. I know the capitals of many countries, but that also does not have an important effect on my daily life. At a more significant level, I can know that what I eat and what exercise I engage in will have an effect on my health. I can believe entirely and completely that I should eat less and exercise more. And my wife helps to remind me that that's a fact as well. I can know it for sure, and I do. With 100% certainty, this is true. But if I do nothing about it, and you can judge how well I am in doing something about it, if I do nothing about it, then it's only head knowledge and it's not something I believe with my heart and therefore allow to change my life. We can think of other areas of knowledge that we hold in this same way, both believing that something is true in our head but not actually accepting it in our heart. We can know for sure in our head that prayer is necessary for us to grow close to God and that avoiding this or that situation of temptation is necessary for us to preserve the holiness of life which allows us to enter God's presence. But if these are only held in our head and not in our heart, then they will have little or no influence on the way we live our life. We would be able to write an essay or an article about how Christians live and how they grow close to God, and we could say things that were entirely accurate and true. But if we do not experience and participate in such beliefs in our heart, then we will be writing about things we have not experienced ourselves. There is a sense in which Satan himself could write an article about the Christian life, and it might be very accurate as far as it went, but it would not be anything that he had any personal experience of at all. It would not be anything that he had gained any personal benefit from, either in salvation or in healing. And we know that in ordinary life, we can be like an ordinary member of their family has gained by knowing them personally and experiencing life with them. This really matters, because our Lord Jesus Christ shows us on many occasions that it really matters. In the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, both groups looked the same. I was talking to someone here in Toronto about this parable, and they were sure that it was five foolish men and five wise women. Uh, I had to explain they were all women, but that would have made the story fit probably even better. Both groups looked exactly the same. They were in the same place. They were waiting for the same happy event. But in fact, five of them did not have enough oil. And when they needed it, they were without light and illumination. It was not enough that they looked like the others. It was not enough that they behaved like the others. It was not even enough that they found themselves in the same place as the others. There was something essential and spiritual missing from their lives and hearts, which meant that they had nothing in common at all with those who were prepared and whose lamps were filled with oil. And in our own understanding within orthodoxy, we know that that represents the grace of the Holy Spirit within the heart. When the bridegroom came, they were not ready to meet him. And when they returned after the door was shut, they heard the words, away from me, I never knew you. 
We can have the appearance of knowledge and wisdom. The Pharisees certainly did. But it seems to me that it was only to these, the intellectual elite of Israel, that the Lord Jesus cries out, woe, woe, woe. There's several times in the year when, if I'm reading the gospel, uh, it's rather an unhappy event. And every verse begins, woe to you. But he doesn't say that to the ordinary people. He says that to the Pharisees and the scribes, those who had a great deal of knowledge about God, but who showed by their behavior they had no real knowledge of God. If you wanted to know about the Jewish religion, you could go to a Pharisee. If you wanted to know about how to tithe the herbs in your garden, they would help you. If you wanted to know how you could make sure you gave the minimum amount necessary to the temple tax, they would help you arrange that. If you wanted to learn how to be holy by avoiding sinners and other low-class people, then you could follow their example. But for all of their knowledge, most of them were condemned by Jesus Christ, by God himself, because they had utterly and completely failed to understand the meaning and the substance of the Jewish religion. And for all of their knowledge about God, they had never begun to enter into a life-giving and transforming relationship with him. <coughs> St. Paul speaks in Colossians 2, 23, about those who even in the church and after the triumphant resurrection of Christ want to make the gospel about rules and regulations before everything else. He says, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in a self-imposed religion, but it is a false humility and even neglect of the body is no value against the indulgence of the flesh. There is a great potential for us, especially if we are priests and servants and we are engaged in the instruction of others, to have only an external knowledge of God and about our faith, and yet assume that the appearance of things represents the interior reality. But St. Paul makes it clear that essentially a self-imposed religion doesn't actually make a difference to our interior life. Indeed, it makes it worse. We look at ourselves and what we know and what we do, and we can assume quite wrongly that we are making spiritual and interior progress. And we can look at others and assume the same thing. In the context of our Coptic Orthodox spiritual tradition, we can say that knowledge of many Bible stories is not the same as that knowledge in the heart which brings them alive in our own experience. Of course, this does not mean that we should not know many Bible stories, but Satan knows all the Bible stories. What he cannot do is feed on them in the heart, meditate on their meaning, and find the word of God expressed in them, teaching us, instructing us, convicting us, nourishing us. It is possible for us to be able to quote passages of scripture and for them not to have entered our heart and taken root there. The Pharisees understood scripture in this way and they used their knowledge to puff themselves up because when the one about whom all the scripture was written came into the world, they rejected him and even crucified him because the knowledge of scripture had never entered their hearts. On the contrary, when the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, received the news of the conception of St. John the Baptist and came into the presence of St. Elizabeth, her heart was filled with prophetic insight and joy, and she poured out the words of the Magnificat, My soul magnifies the Lord. And this is almost all scripture. But it was not a knowledge of scripture such as the Pharisees had, which made no interior difference. This was a lived experience of the scripture as the word of God. And it is from her heart, not her head, that she pours out a true knowledge, a transforming knowledge of things which have informed and nurtured her own spiritual life and growth. Even in the very first verse of the Magnificat, there are three or four Old Testament allusions. But in the mouth and the heart of the Virgin Mary, these have become her own experience. And they pour out of her heart 
a truth which she has gained over her own experience. And they are not preserved simply as propositions or statements to be repeated. The Lord Jesus challenged the Sadducees when they confronted him with their beliefs about the life after death. They were also considered, together with the Pharisees, to be the wise and serious, intelligent people of their day. But Jesus says to them, you are therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. Of course they knew the scriptures, but they did not really know the scriptures. They had a head knowledge, but the knowledge which is learned and experienced in the heart requires the grace and the power of God, and this was lacking in their own lives. They deceived themselves, and they deceived others by the assumption that their intellectual knowledge of the scriptures was the same as that which could be experienced by those who had truly lived by and with and in the divine wisdom. It is the same wisdom which has written the Holy Scriptures, the same Holy Spirit who wishes to produce in each of us the fruit of his activity as we are nourished by the Holy Scripture. There can be no doubt, and I'm addressing this because I know many of you are Sunday school servants, there can be no doubt at all that the knowledge of the scriptures is essential and important. But we must be very careful that we do not diminish the scriptures by making them simply a collection of stories which we learn and teach about, rather than a source of spiritual nourishment that enters and inflames the heart. When we read the scriptures for spiritual benefit, and so that the heart is touched, we read with prayer. We read slowly and meditatively. We receive the scriptures into the heart when we ask that God will speak through them to our own particular circumstances. And when we apply what we learn and hear in the grace of God to our daily lives, we find that the words of the scriptures have taken root. We can see this in the parable of the houses and the builders when the Lord Jesus says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. <coughs> Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. We can apply this saying to all our efforts at acquiring knowledge in various ways. It remains a head knowledge that cannot help us or save us and which leads us to be puffed up with pride and hypocrisy when we are like the builder on sand who learns things and does not apply them to himself or put them into practice. And we are like the builder on the rock when we are careful to put into practice what we hear and read and learn and seek to experience God in the depths of our being, in the heart itself. It is not only scriptural knowledge which can remain external to the heart and therefore even act against our salvation. The knowledge of hymns and rites can be held in the same way. And we can be proud of ourselves that we know the exact hymn to sing on this occasion or that occasion. Or that we know the words in Coptic to some response and others do not. But it is of no value to us. And it is even harmful to us if we do not experience what we are learning. And if we experience what we are learning, then it enters the heart and transforms us. There is no value in singing a hymn if we do not apply the words to ourselves. There is no value in asking the saints to intercede for us if we chant their names so quickly to get the list out of the way that we cannot even pronounce their names properly. There is no value in knowing the responses to be said in the altar if we have no sense of God's holy presence descending among us and upon us and we are busy having a conversation with others while the priest is praying before God and so many other examples. There is no value in having a good knowledge of our theology if it makes us aggressive and proud, dismissive of the foolishness and ignorance of others. There is no value in having a good knowledge of our theology if we use it as a stick to beat others with. All of this can be said and must be said 
even though I value greatly and completely our tradition of hymns, the beauty of our liturgical rites, the invocation of the saints, the majesty and mystery of our sacraments, and the depth and richness of our theology. I know many of these things well, some of them very well indeed. They are all precious and valuable, but when they are a matter of knowledge in the head only, they can prevent us experiencing salvation and union with the God in the heart by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Because we can assume, looking at the outside of things, that we are already well experienced in the spiritual life, even when perhaps we have hardly begun to grow in the life of God at all. St. Paul, who was certainly knowledgeable and encouraged knowledge in others, says in 1 Corinthians 8, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. It is not that knowledge itself is harmful, since we all have knowledge of different things, but it is knowledge without love which corrupts us and harms others. The question must therefore be, how do we acquire and exercise knowledge in love and for our salvation? And this leads us to consider spirituality. It would be a mistake to imagine that knowledge and spirituality are opposite extremes and that we must either be knowledgeable in, and intelligent or spiritual and foolish in the eyes of the world. We have considered that head knowledge, as far as it describes knowledge of things about God and not a true knowledge of God, is not much different from the knowledge of demons and Satan. <coughs> they also know a great many facts about God, but they have never experienced the warmth of his loving presence in the heart. But it would be a mistake to imagine that life without knowledge is the same as the spiritual life. These are not opposites and extremes. We bring these two ideas of knowledge and spirituality together when we appreciate the words of Evagrius of Ponticus. He says very famously, a theologian is one who prays, and one who prays truly is a theologian. Many people are engaged in the study of what we call theology in modern times. I teach a class on theology in our churches in Manchester. But what we call theology today is not exactly what Evagrius is speaking about, nor is it what the other early fathers of the church meant by theology. There is, of course, a necessary and proper study of the writings of the fathers and the teachings of the church in an academic sense. I read and study many academic books and papers. I am pleased that I have many younger friends in our Coptic Orthodox Church who are gaining a detailed understanding of specific aspects of our theology, history, liturgics, and many other important areas. This is all absolutely necessary and absolutely commendable, and I write about these things myself. But this is not what Evagrius or the fathers of our church meant by theology. What they meant by theology was an understanding and learning from God himself by encountering him in prayer and in the spiritual life. And when we make it only a matter of reading academic books, we're missing something very significant. What he means by theology and what the church truly means by theology is the direct experience of God so that our theology is not just words about God or about our orthodox faith, but it is formed as the theological content of the hymns and prophecies of the Virgin Mary. It is formed and experienced in an actual encounter with God. The theologian is one who prays, and one who prays truly is a theologian. Not so much because prayer True prayer leading to union with God gives us good ideas of what to talk about, but because in true prayer we actually encounter God himself, and we actually learn about God and learn from God himself. We gain an insight into our lives and the lives of others through actually participating in the life of God through prayer and worship spirituality and reflection on the scriptures. 
true theology, a true knowledge of God himself, comes about through true prayer. And this is what unites knowledge and spirituality in the Orthodox tradition. This is what we are seeking for. It does not require us to abandon knowledge, but it is required for us to seek and use knowledge in a spiritual manner and in the experience of meeting God ourselves and growing into a close relationship with him. In fact, we can say that all of the exterior knowledge that we gain, our understanding of the teaching of the Bible, the stories of the life of our Lord Jesus in the Gospels, our understanding of the hymns and the rites and the history of the church, these are all important to us because they inform and give structure to our spirituality. It's not enough to say that we should pray, for instance. Lots of people pray. Lots of religions encourage prayer. But the prayer which is necessary for our spiritual growth with God is described in a particular manner in our own Orthodox tradition. This is not an optional extra. It is the necessary structure that we have in our spirituality for encountering God. If I want to learn to pray, if I want to encounter God, then it is the orthodox spiritual tradition which provides us with a lasting and universal instruction. I cannot just decide for myself how I will pray because I want to have spiritual feelings. I cannot decide for myself how I will understand the Bible, how I will choose to worship, how will I serve in the church. I cannot decide for myself what I will believe about God and Christ and salvation and the church. All of these things are found in the necessary knowledge which our orthodox tradition provides, but they only come truly to life when we unite them with true prayer and the encounter with God within us. This spiritual structure which our Coptic orthodox tradition gives us forms the boundary of it prevents us wandering to the left or the right. It provides us with the substance and content of our spiritual life so that we can be nourished, we can be encouraged to grow in our experience of God. To pray with knowledge according to our Coptic Orthodox spiritual tradition, and not as if it was just something external we did to please God, puts the knowledge we have gained to work in a way that does not produce pride last page and does not puff us up but equally when we follow our Coptic Orthodox spiritual tradition we find that our spirituality is not allowed to become just sentimentality doing what we like doing what gives me good feeling what does this mean in practice there is no special rule and no special prayer which will transform everything without any effort but we are to seek the kingdom of God before all things and everything else we need in our life will then find their proper place. We are to engage in the spiritual life of our Coptic Orthodox tradition and our goal and ambition must be union with God as far as we can possibly experience by the indwelling spirit. And it is this experience of actually meeting God day by day which will teach us how to use and value, value our knowledge in the right way. We are to read the Bible and study it certainly, but in our reading and study we must be always asking, and as Sunday school servants we must always be encouraging the children in our care to ask, what does God say to me? What does he say to me personally as I read and reflect on the scriptures? Where is the spiritual food the nourishment for my heart in what I am reading. We must not be content for ourselves to have a mental appreciation only of the words and the text, nor must we be content for our children to have only a mental appreciation of the words, the stories, and the text. It must speak to us, and we must help it speak to them as the word of God when we give it prayerful attention. We are to pick up the Agbeah as our church encourages us. But we are not performing a practice that we hope will please a distant God or that we feel is necessary to avoid provoking God's anger. As we slowly and carefully and prayerfully read each word with as much attention and warmth as possible, 
we will discover that they come alive to us and have a meaning beyond anything simply academic and intellectual. We have to pray the words of the Agbeah and the other words of the prayers of our holy church so that they become our own words. And they become our own words as we pray with our heart and not only with the head. Even when we are studying theology and church history and liturgy, we must always be asking, what does this teach me of God? How do I encounter him through these studies and this knowledge? We must not be content to learn a new hymn, especially if we feel pleased that we will be able to impress others. We have only gained a true knowledge of any hymn when we reflect on the words and have made it our own in every way by practice and participation. This applies to all areas of religious and spiritual knowledge, and even in the secular knowledge that we gain in studies and at work and at university. If it has not made a difference to us and become embedded in the heart, then it is not true knowledge, knowledge of God himself, but is a knowledge only of things, which certainly has some value, but can easily lead to us being puffed up. When we seek to understand and experience the truth of what we have learned within the heart, through careful reflection, through prayer, through humble service and obedience, only then does it become a true knowledge, a transforming knowledge, a knowledge embedded in our spirituality, so that we are learning through a direct encounter with God and not only learning things about God. The one who prays truly is the one who is gaining a true knowledge of all things in the heart. May this be so for all of us, as we seek to be those who have a life-giving and transforming experience of God in the heart by the indwelling Holy Spirit, who will teach us the truth of all things, and will give us insight and true knowledge to teach others especially the children whom we love so much, as we give ourselves to unceasing prayer and seeking union with God in the heart by grace. For his glory and our salvation. God or service first I have been given advice to start serving and that will help growing close to God uh, yeah absolutely uh, we should never imagine in our spiritual life that uh, we cannot do something until we have done something else uh, we have to be doing everything all at once um, and uh, serving and obedience is a necessary aspect of growing closer to God um, in my visit here I have tried very hard whenever I've been asked to do something just to say yes. Uh, and it's very good for us in a normal way to always say yes to everything we are asked to do, believing that it is God asking us to do some service. Uh, at the same time, it is good to have feelings that we are not prepared, that we are unworthy, that there are other people who are better than us. Uh, but if we remember the parable of the two sons, our uh, Lord speaks of a father saying to one son, will you go and do this service? And the son says, of course, dad, I'll go and do it straight away. And he doesn't get up. The other son says, oh, I'm too busy. Leave me alone. And then he reflects and he goes and does the service. And our Lord tells us that the fine words are not enough. 
What really matters is whether we actually go and do the service. So it is much better to do service even when we feel we're a long way from God, as long as we are aware that we are fr away from God. Uh, what we must avoid is feeling, I am doing this service, so everything is okay, God is pleased with me. Uh, our, our knowledge of God, as I've been trying to say, is one where we have the closest of relationships. It's not one where we are coming to do things for God who is far away from us. Uh, when we come even to the liturgy, we are coming to meet with God and to be united with him. And even in our simple service, we should feel this is part of the way I am going to grow closer to God. Because in whatever service I am doing, I am not doing it on my own, I am doing it with God. So, so please, we should never say, I cannot do this service until I am prepared. Uh, we should understand that service is a necessary part of our spiritual life. Uh, perhaps more important than many other things. It is in service that we learn humility. Uh, it is in service that we learn our own limitations and we are led to call on God more and more. How can we live what we teach so that we show, these are all moving up and down as I'm speaking. How can we live what we teach so that we show each other more love? We are not as welcoming as we would like to be to people we didn't grow up with. Okay, well, your, your holy fathers have been very welcoming to me, so uh, some of them are very welcoming to people that they haven't grown up with. Uh, I am convinced that at the root of all of our problems is our relationship with God. And in other churches where there have been problems, there are problems in every, other, every church, uh, I stayed in one place and every day I said we need more prayer and we need more love. And people would say to me, yes, but, and I would say, no, there are no buts. We always need more prayer and more love. If we do not have love, we need to pray more. If we have love, we will pray more. So if we feel like this person has written here, we are not showing a warm enough welcome, the very first thing we must be doing is becoming more Christian ourselves, but we must pray about this. If it is on your heart, we are not a very welcoming church, then every day pray earnestly, Lord, show us how to become a more welcoming church. And the prayers that we pray when we are seeing problems within our family, they will begin to be the answer to prayer because we will start discovering, how can I be a welcoming person? What do I need to do? I go to some churches and there are problems, real problems which are identified, but everyone is waiting for someone else to provide the answer. So when we see something like this, we are not as welcoming as we would like. Whoever that person was, you begin to become the answer to that prayer. But pray also for your priests, that they will see what they need to do. Pray for your brothers and sisters in the church that they will see what they need to do. But whoever you are, you become a welcoming person. And then already the church will begin to change. I am absolutely convinced all of our problems are solved by prayer before everything else. And even when some of our problems require practical solutions, we should be committing ourselves to serious, earnest prayer. Not just a prayer at the beginning of a meeting, Lord Jesus, we hope you can help us fix this, but over many, many days and weeks and months, asking that God will provide the solution instead of us. So turn to prayer. Become the spiritual person God wants you to be, and the church itself will begin to change. What if, no, what if knowledge is disturbing spirituality when it comes to complicated information about the dogma, what should come first? There are many very intelligent people who have no faith in God. Uh, they know a great many things about Christianity, but it's not something that has entered the heart. There are ignorant people. Some of us can be more ignorant than we should be. We should be investing more time in understanding. But we know that within our church community and in the wider church community around the world, some of those who have the greatest knowledge of God are the people who are very simple. They don't have a great knowledge of theology and dogma. Uh, we can speak of the 21 martyrs in Libya. They were ordinary people. They were not people writing books about theology, but there was something about their relationship with God which has given a testimony across the world to people outside of our church even atheists 
see how they face death in the name of Christ and are challenged by it. So I feel that if you do not have peace in whatever you are studying, then step back a little bit. Uh, because in our spiritual life, we should find an increasing peace as we grow into union with God. There are, there are young men I spend time with online, and I was a young man like that myself to some extent, filled with a desire to share dogma and doctrine, and I, could, I, cannot, I cannot say how important that is. It's the structure of our faith. But when it leads you to lack peace, there is something wrong. Many times I could write 3,000 words answering someone's question, why I'm not a monophysite heretic. And I wake up in the morning and the person just says, I don't care. You know? And I feel full of anger. I feel full of frustration. Uh, I feel full of wanting to write another article to explain even more. Maybe you haven't understood. Uh, now I don't live like that at all. Uh, I write some books. I write some blogs. But it is not my job to explain everything to everybody. It's not my job to read every book about our spiritual tradition or our theology. I'm not saved by that. And you've seen, I don't mean that we shouldn't become intelligent and, and educated. But what matters most to me as a priest is to be a man of prayer and spirituality. What matters most to you in your service as servants is to be spiritual men and women. Uh, as I try to say here, the, the the knowledge must be used for our spirituality. And when the knowledge is overwhelming us, then we're clearly doing it in the wrong way. So whenever we lack peace, we should retreat back to what we know. The Agbeya prayers, being still with God, reading the scriptures and asking him, him to speak to us. And we should rediscover actually meeting God and hearing God speak to us in that way. Uh, otherwise, we can become overwhelmed and confused. Uh, and we find that we're building a life on knowledge and not on the experience of God. So whenever we feel that we're not at peace, it means there's something wrong and we need to go back to what we know. One more. What treasures of the Coptic Orthodox Church can we offer to the Western world as servants? Okay. Um, I am convinced that we are on the edge of an exciting time, really. Because we are now living, here we are in Toronto, almost whichever direction I appear from, I can see this wonderful church building from miles away. Um, increasingly, our Coptic Orthodox Church is becoming well known through Ambangelos in England. Whenever there is a, a national event, Ambangelos is there. He's regularly on the BBC. We have our martyrs who appear on the news. We have their families expressing their, their, their faith in a way that other people around us can't imagine. And we have within our church, within all of orthodoxy, but I'm sitting here in a Coptic church, we have such a spiritual treasure that actually heals people of the problems they are facing. It unites them with God and it allows them to become truly alive as human beings. It is the answer to the problems that are faced by all of the millions of people around us who are struggling to cope with life without God in different and dangerous and harmful ways. It's as if we have the cure for cancer, you know? Uh, we have the cure for the human condition that is being faced by all the people around us. And now, here we are, we are no longer communities of a small number of recent immigrants praying in Arabic not quite sure how we fit into the society around us. We are a church here and in every other place where half of the members of our church are Canadian in one way or another, speaking English as their first language. If we can learn how to experience and communicate the treasures of our spirituality as a medicine for the people around us, I think we have something to say, good news to share, and I think the people around us are ready to hear it. In the UK, my evangelism is conducted based on teaching about prayer. Uh, I don't teach, I, I can teach about many things, sometimes I do do general talks, but I don't teach so much about iconography. I don't teach so much about liturgics. I teach about our orthodox way of spirituality. Because I can be in a meeting in a Protestant church, a Baptist church, 
And when I teach about orthodox spirituality, every person there can grow closer to God through what I am saying. They may remain in their Baptist church, but they have started learning how to be closer to God through our orthodox spiritual tradition. Uh, and so this is how I believe we have something to share. Uh, we need to be writing books. We need to be producing professional videos. We need to be having seminars here where we are helping people learn about our spirituality of prayer. That is especially what is unique to us, especially what is healing and saving for other people. Uh, and in my experience in the UK, many people are ready to hear something more. When I was a young man, I would go to Pentecostal churches and charismatic churches. I experienced lots of worship with a big band. It was very exciting. Many people in Britain have gone to churches like that, feeling that maybe having a strong emotion is an expression of life with God. But for many of us, and for me, we go home from such a service, and after a little while, the emotion dies down, and we discover we're in the same place. But our orthodox spirituality actually changes people. It actually makes a difference. And even if a person is staying in a Protestant church, I did for a long while, I was still a Protestant, but I had begun to include orthodox spirituality in my life. And the reason I became orthodox in the Coptic church was because I found it worked and it made a difference. And this is what I believe is the great gift we have to the people around us. The way to actually meet God the way to actually become a truly human person, to find healing for loneliness, lack of self-esteem, boredom, lack of direction, all of those things that people are facing in the world around us, the answer is here in our orthodox spiritual life. Uh, so I'm very excited to be in the church at this time. Uh, 20 years ago, our churches would have been much more Arabic speaking, much more recent immigrants. It would be very hard for me to have a service. But now I feel we are ready to start sharing our faith with the world around us. And I hope that we'll do that over the next years. Shukran. Thank you so much, Abuna, again. And um, great wealth of uh, knowledge. And uh, we look uh, forward to have your reverence again with us. Um, we need more time because the, the, the screen is uh, full of other questions. Maybe we should uh, just uh, book another time just for the questions. <laughs> Abuna is so humble. I, uh, whatever I say, like uh, I'm not sure what to say. And then anything comes out of my mouth and it's like, sure, for sure, we'll do it. I'll do it. Of course, Abuna. Hader. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, I'm trying to learn. <laughs> I'm trying to learn myself. Uh, I, I've had a cough for a couple of weeks. Uh, and I came to church this morning, and as you can see, I've still got a bit of a cough. And I felt, shall I tell Abuna Pishoy, I can't pray, you know? Uh, I'll just do a little bit. Um, and I came and I prayed here, you know? And these words here, as I prayed, uh, Pope Kyrillos is the saint of my church, you know? Rest assured very, very much, and don't think a lot about it, but let the matter of his command. You know? And I felt he was saying, stop worrying, just do what you're told. Um, and when we just do what we are told, as a husband at home, I try to just do what I'm told also, all of your problems go away. Um, just a couple of notes here before we leave. For the Sunday school uh, servants, please make sure that uh, there is a note from um, the people taking care of the servants taking care of the, the small boxes. Please make sure don't leave them behind or sometime you take out the money and leave it. Uh, if you need access to the, uh, the cupboard, please uh, speak to Nahid and uh, we'll make that uh, available. Uh, also, uh, I hope everyone is enjoying the journey of the Great Lent and uh, we're all uh, fasting uh, and praying uh, for the service. And I loved so much a uh, part that Abuna uh, mentioned in his talk today. Uh, be an answer to someone else's prayer. Right? 
be an answer to someone else's prayer. So we pray a lot and we ask for so many things, but Abuna today really taught us um, that we need to pray to be an answer to some to other people's uh, prayer. Thank you so much uh, again, Abuna. Um, anything else? Abuna, please lead us in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Heavenly Father, who heals us, who takes all our worries away, who gives us, O Lord, rest in your rest. Give us, O Lord, not to worry by your presence among us. Be inside us, O Lord, and bless us with all the heavenly blessings. Unite us, O Lord, with the heavenly. Unite us, O Lord, with your self. Unite us, O Lord, that we may know and discern the truth about you and to know and to live with you now at this time and at all times of our life on this earth and in eternity that you lead us O Lord to enter into your rest at all times through the intercession of Saint Mary Saint Mark the Apostle and Saint Demian and Saint Marine and Saint Abbasqueron of Kaldin and Pope Kiralos the Six and the blessings of these holy days of great Lent and the prayer accompanied with the prayers of my father and the prayers of my brothers and sisters gathered here together make us worthy O Lord to pray together to you saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as in heaven give us this day daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil one in Christ Jesus our Lord for there is the kingdom power and glory forever and ever Amen in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son be with you, all your families, all those you love, and all those whom you serve in this place. And may the Lord give you true knowledge and experience of Him in your service, now and forever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Depart in peace. The Lord be with you all. And thank you again for your wonderful hospitality here.